Well, this morning, um, we're sort of in between, well, we are, it's not even sort of, we're in between series, and we're going to take a snapshot, if you like, of the life of um, BBC and where we're at and where we're going and what God's been showing us and how he's going to be shaping us into the future. So as we do that, um, I'm just going to ask us to join together in prayer. So let me, let me lead us in prayer. Father, as we um, look at scripture this morning, as we reflect upon our own journey as a church, um, we want to be able to capture that fusion that exists between uh, your, word of God, your, your word and your spirit and how it is that this adventure of faith is being outworked amongst us. So God, we, um, we want to commit this time to you and trust that you would, you would lead us in our visioneering, in our imagine, imagination, uh, uh, this journey of faith and what it means for us to be the bride of Christ. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, a bit of a tragedy happened yesterday at home. Uh, jumped in the shower, no water, no hot water. So um, coldest, shortest day of the year, the hot water cylinders turned off. You know, so uh, we had some folks around for a meal. I'd just been to the gym. I'd just done some, so I'd have a cold shower. I felt sorry for me. And um, this morning, I thought, right, uh, there's only one way for this, so I went down the gym this morning, walked into the gym, and walked out again after having a shower, and I was like, <laughs> sort of like a, a micro workout, you know, um, like my normal workout is. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to um, just remind ourselves this morning of uh, who we are, just to start off with and push into what it is that we feel God is doing and what God is saying to us. Um, the opening of Scripture has this incredible sense of anticipation about it, doesn't it? It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now if we just stop and look at those verses and meditate upon them, uh, we realise that there was essentially earth created by God, but nothing much going on. But the sense of anticipation there, when it says the Spirit of God was hovering, now, when people are hovering around you, or when you're hovering around somebody, there's always something that is about to happen, isn't it? Is that true? Yeah? If you're teenage boys, they hover around the fridge, okay? And, um, you know, hovering around your children's homework when they're doing that, when, you know, that was always a way which you get yourself in trouble as a parent. Um, myself, I'm starting to embark on hovering around the kitchen, giving Michaela advice on what to cook and how to cook it. That doesn't go down too good, really. Um, so even though I sort of felt myself offering uh, creative advice in respect to the same way that the, the, the Spirit wanted to create on the earth, um, I've found that um, the Lord of all is still the Lord of all in the kitchen. And so um, anyway, hovering is about anticipation. Hovering is about what is it that God is going to do next? And then we move to the other end of the book, other end of our book, the scriptures, the Bible, and it says this in the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from, from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. So here's, here's the complete opposite of this, this whole story, this whole narrative. We're, we've, we've got this story that's happening around us and we're in the middle of it. And what it's saying is that there's a, a new heaven, a new earth. The sea that was part of the initial creation is no longer there. Uh, and, but we've been told that uh, there is a new Jerusalem and coming down from heaven uh, to meet the bride is this, is this marriage. There's this marriage between Christ and his church. And we are this church. We're the church that's being created. We're the church that has been created. And we're the church that will be created. Okay, the, the thing about it is that we have been given this place in this story of God that is so vital to everything that God wants to do on planet Earth. But it, this, this, uh, this verse, these verses push on. And they say this, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order 
of things has passed away. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes we just need to take a couple of steps back, don't we? And just look at the bigger picture of what we're part of. You know, the God who created from that formless environment with his spirit hovered with anticipation. And we see the wrap up. We actually see how it is that's gonna, gonna come to completion. A new order of things because the old order has passed away. No more crying, no more tears, no more death, no more sadness, no more sickness. Amazing, isn't it? Beautiful, isn't it? And we, the, the bride, we are the part of this, this church that is the intrinsic dwelling place of the Holy Spirit throughout this time since, since Christ. And so in the middle of history, of course, we have this, this powerful, powerful event of Jesus coming into our world, God's Son breaking into our world. And we know his story. Most of us know his story well because it's the centerpiece for our faith. It's the centerpiece, the story of God breaking into our world uh, through the Virgin Mary, God born into humble circumstances to be raised by humble parents, to be uh, given to us as a gift, a prophet, a healer, a teacher, somebody who reflects and represents everything that God is. And in doing so, he became a point of contact for those who are seeking God, but also a point of anguish for those who were defying God. And so we know he was put to death on a cross, but in doing that, he even had a plan. Victory. Victory came through death as he took upon his own body our sins on the cross. And not only completing that task of being a sacrificial lamb, but of course, rising from the grave. And we are people of hope. We are people of the resurrection. And that's why for us, we live in this, in this place, uh, somewhere in this, this goal of God's history. And we're never quite sure where we fit. There are certain times in history when the world has said, surely, surely we are near the return of Christ. Surely the world is really struggling at the moment. And then there are times when it seems to be more peace. And so we've lived with this tension of the fact that Christ will return. But in between times, we're called to be the church. And God's invested himself into the church throughout the history, throughout the history of the world, throughout uh, the world itself, and we here are a local chapter of what God is doing in this intergalactic organization called the church. And it's amazing to be a part of it. It's bigger than all of us. It's, uh, it just blows my mind how God uses normal people like us, empowered to be able to be a part of his church and his agency in the world. Well, let's get ourselves back down to earth a little bit here um, and talk about Bethlehem Baptist Church. Bethlehem Baptist Church um, has been in existence for just over 30 years. And last year, if you were with us, we celebrated with uh, founding pastor Tom and Aileen Frew coming and spending a morning with us and uh, really encouraging us with what it was that uh, uh, he found, he, he, what God was showing him during those early days. Um, I asked Ben, who puts my slides together, to bring up a, um, a slide of our new sign at the front gate. And so this is what he gave me. Um, he also showed me that the sign had won a silver medal at the New Zealand um, Sign Writers uh, Annual Awards. <laughs> uh, Ben's pretty proud of it because he essentially designed it and asked the guys to build it. So, um, so we've got a little bit more than we bargained for in this slide. Ben was just sort of showing you his good work. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it's cool. So, um, so it's, well, maybe not quite a sign from God, but it's a, it's a sign nonetheless. But in, there, in, that, uh, in that sign, we've had this promise line uh, for a better part of 25 years now. It's called, Where New Hope is Born. Where New Hope is Born. And the reason why that was so important to us is because we know that Christ and his church, the bride of Christ, is a place of the resurrection, a place of hope. And so we captured what it is that we believe is important for us to represent to the community around us, that we are a place where new hope is born. But we also captured, we believe, the essence of the story of Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, 
where Christ was born in Bethlehem and new hope was born. So he had the opportunity to fuse history with the present reality. And we believe God has given us this, this message, this, this goal, this promise of new hope for people. And so it's been the case for many, many years now. Um, God's story for us has been one of God's grace and blessing. Um, Michaela and I have uh, joined the church uh, in 25 years at the end of this year. We've been here. Tom Frew and Aileen were there for six years. So that, do the maths. That's 30, 31. It works out. Um, but um, when we look back at the times when we started, and, and many of you here were, were, were present when we turned up, um, look around and see some familiar faces and, uh, and have some great memories and some great, great journeys that we've been on together. Uh, but we used to meet in the Bethlehem Baptist Hall. And in the hall, uh, it was just one big echo box. That's all it was, really. Um, the kids, the three and four-year-olds, used to meet in literally the cleaning cupboard. Um, and the, um, the, the creche was behind a curtain, behind the stage. And that was always fun, competing with the kids when you were preaching. Um, the toilets were through the door there. So um, we all would pray more for people who had prostate problems as they had to sneak out more regularly. Um, and so, the, you know, so this was an adventure of faith for us. Um, often we would find that there was um, the residue of the 21st uh, from the night before. One, one particular morning, um, Ray Willis will remember this, he was part of the cleanup, but the keg of beer must have spilt and there was about a quarter inch of beer on the whole floor of the, of the hall. Um, we were dancing in the spirit that day. It was a, it was a unique experience. But, um, but we had to break out of there. We had to break out of there. And so we broke out by buying some land on Moffat Road, and that land uh, was subsequently purchased by the Bethlehem Motoran. That's where that, that, build, uh, that property is now. And that released capital for us to come and look for another piece of land. Uh, which a couple of gentlemen did. Um, Merv Hunger and Graham Harris are still with us. I think. Oh, he's, oh, he's Merv there. Merv is the chairman of our building committee. Oh, he's Graham too, sitting beside them. Hey, they're, still, they're still wondering what they did. But um, they came down here and they were looking for some land for us. And they got uh, talking to Harry, who used to own the land here, and said, yeah, I'd love to sell you a bit of land. And uh, he says, but I can't sell you a piece of land because we can't subdivide off less than a couple of acres, you know. But uh, we went to the council, and the council said, oh, here's this old, this old law on the books that says, um, for the purposes of religious worship, you're allowed to subdivide off something smaller. And like that had been sitting there for 100 years. And uh, so we invoked that, and we got the land, bought this hectare for 220000 it's the old story, hey, if you knew, what you knew where prices were going to go, you would have bought the whole lot regardless. But, uh, but God has been good to us. God has been so good to us with respect to uh, buildings. But the building released for us a mechanism to do mission. And that's been the, the beauty of having a building, is that a building is like an engine in a, in a car. You know, you can have a, have a, a car with a little 850cc motor and you're going nowhere in a hurry. Okay, but a, a good building serves the purposes that God wants. And so for us, we've been able to maximize the use of this building. And God has allowed us to be able to not only take the initial build and then a subsequent two-story part of the building, and then a third part was putting on two new auditoriums. And uh, I was talking to Adam Yates there about six months ago, and we were, Adam was one of our elders, and uh, he's been in that role for nearly, nearly 20 years, I think, uh, maybe over 20 years. And... Um, um, he says, you know, um, Craig, you look back at those days when we built that first part of the building and uh, Adam was in charge of the finance and um, he, says, uh, he said, oh, I was looking at you, Craig, thinking, man, I hope you know what you're doing, you know, because we're pushing on with this building. And I said, really? I said, you were the guy with the money. I just said, I thought you knew what you were doing. <laughs> and uh, the whole idea was that you would just call a halt to it if it was going to stop. And uh, Colin Rickard, who was building with his partner, Graham, um, where's, that's what Rhonda a moment ago, eh? um, you know, he just kept on building and he just kept on building until the money ran out. And man, we, we got here. And uh, it's just been amazing. So there's stories amongst stories and we need to remember them as a community. 
But one of the critical things about this church is that from its foundation, mission was a part of it. We were very blessed by having some, uh, some really solid, uh, outward-looking people involved in the life of the church. Tom Frew was an evangelist and, a, and had a traveling ministry. So he was employed only three quarters time, I think, if my memory serves me right. And uh, the other time he would be spending out on the streets. No, not, not sure on the streets, sometimes. But doing crusades throughout New Zealand and Australia. So Tom and Aileen, heart for the lost, heart for those who don't know God, uh, was really a big part of the DNA of the life of this church. Not only that, but uh, we had um, three couples turn up uh, who were really involved in overseas mission. David and Linda Cowie, John and Marion Brignall, Simon and Alison Cornwall, all part of YWAM, YWAM Mercy Ships. And we got the privilege of seeing God do miracles up close where literally a ship was given to these people to do medical work throughout the Pacific. And so we were partnering, we were praying, we were providing, we were chipping off rust, putting paint on boats and sending people off to do mission work throughout the Pacific. And this initiated for us a real solid connection with overseas mission, which we are really grateful for uh, because it's seeded within us a sense in which this is not about us. This is always about others. Uh, some of you may have read in the Bay of Plenty Times two weeks ago, um, David made the, David Linda made the, the centre uh, feature for the Saturday night's paper, uh, talking about their 50 years of mission. 50 years of, and the literally hundreds of thousands of people who have had medical uh, services done for them in the Pacific and, and heard the hope of the gospel at the same time. Uh, it's a powerful, powerful legacy. And so now they're up in Vanuatu starting out this health clinic up there. They're working with the government. They're working with health communities. Um, and a lot of folks from all over the world are pouring and bringing their resources to serve this underprivileged community. Prior to that, David and Linda initiated what we now know as the Ruel Orphanage. Uh, Warren and Pauline Curtis-Smith are up there running this. And so we've had the privilege, what I'm saying, of having real quality DNA planted in, our, in the life of our church. And so we've been able to bless. And a church is blessed to be a blessing. You know, the, the, the whole goal is not what we gain, but what we give away. You know, I was out at Tapuna just a few weeks ago watching the Icons program out there. Uh, a bunch of um, great little kids from Tapuna. Um, you know, good things come from that place. Um, I went to Tapuna School. I saw myself there, in a, in a, you know, a few years ago, <laughs> and these little boys running around doing their thing. But I saw the the love. I saw the intentionality. I saw the passion, the wisdom of God upon those who are leading this group. And these men come from our church, just like the other Icons programs that run here, uh, Icons for Girls. And all the way through our children's ministries, through our youth groups, uh, increasingly our young adults, all of these people are infused with something of the DNA that is found in this place. And we even heard testimonies this morning, didn't we, of someone saying, um, I came in and I felt something. This is a story we hear so regularly. I felt something in the air. And uh, David, that's your part of your story, isn't it? Um, and so we hear these things, and we just know God is doing something bigger than all of us. And so BBC Mission is a, is a really, really vital part of our DNA. You know, we are here to share the gospel. Uh, if, if we don't, we might as well just pack up and go home. Because if this is just to be a social club, uh, we should have beer on tap and bingo on Fridays. You know? Who said amen? I heard that. <laughs> We're here to seek and save the lost. We're the bride of Christ. Yeah? So this morning I feel a little bit like Paul, uh, sorry, not Paul, John, who writes the letters to the churches, the seven churches from the book of Revelation. Uh, because John starts off saying, these things are good, but these things also you must tend to. And there's something that I, I want to talk to us about in the life of our church, which I think we can do a whole lot better. I'd like us to grab a fresh season of hospitality. Um, you see, hospitality is a real vital part of the life of a church. It sounds simple, uh, but it's intentional. 
And maybe because we've had the cafe, uh, there's a lot of coffee and food and all that going on in the cafe, uh, it's removed that vital part that we can all play by sharing our homes and opening up our lives to one another. Um, at times I hear people saying to me, you know, BBC is not a very friendly church, which of course breaks my heart, you know, because I try to be a friendly guy and I hope it rubs off, you know, that's the best I can do. Um, but um, there are times in the life of the church when we, we, uh, we're quite intentional about building relationships for each other. And, uh, and that's something that I really want us to take seriously. So I'd love you to open up your homes, love you to try to get to know people. And a simple question that you can ask yourself is, have I got to know somebody really well in the last 12 months, 18 months that I haven't known before? Because uh, that's a simple question, isn't it? That relates to all of us. And if the answer is no, then you can do something about that. Um, just to tell you what my dark, dark space and place looks like, I'll tell you. Okay, my dark space. Um, last year, probably about this time last year, we ran an event, sort of, we used to call it Dinner for Eight, and we allocate, people sign up, you know, it's a free will thing, you're not forced to do anything, uh, and saying, I'm free to go to somebody's place for dinner to meet a whole bunch of people they haven't met before. And so some folks put their hands up and say, we'll host that meal. And so we, time it for a, we timed it for a particular day, I think it was a Friday night or a Saturday night, I can't remember specifically, and on Monday, we got these reports that some people were hosting and no one turned up. It's like, oh, hold on. Had you contacted them beforehand? Yep. Did they contact you and say you couldn't, they couldn't make it? No. Man, I was dark. I was real dark. I said to the folks organising it, I said, give me the names of those people who didn't turn up. <laughs> I'm going to ring them and tell them not to be so rude. It would be the nicest thing. And they said, we're not giving you the names. I said, give me the names. These people need to know that they've upset people who have opened their homes up and that people didn't come, didn't even have the courtesy of calling to say they wouldn't make it. And they said, we're not going to give you the names, Craig. And I said, why? They said, because it won't be good for you. And I said, I'm not worried about me. It won't be good for them. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, took me all week to recover from that and maybe I still haven't, I need to go to Place of Hope Counselling Centre I think and talk to somebody there you see um, to me one of the most basic Christian values is just simple respect for one another and if somebody's connected with you and opened their home and you don't turn up they're like get a life, seriously or get a new church, seriously I'm, I just can't be bothered with that I seriously can't be bothered with that we're a community, we're a body, and, uh, and people need to love, honour, and respect one another. Uh, this isn't a cafe. This isn't a place where you turn up and just get your goods and go. We're trying to build community here because we want to ensure that your life is not done on your own. We want you to know that you build relationships like an investment for the future, even if you don't see a need for it now. Um, the last two weeks, we've had two funerals. Pastor Eric took those funerals, did a fantastic job. Both of those folks were very new to our church. One actually turned up here knowing he was terminally ill and uh, he, he was embraced by the community and um, <laughs> even in his last few days he just in hospital couldn't stop testifying to the love of God. You know, and we're like this is what we're here for. But relationships count. So I just want you to take it upon yourselves to, to um, to reach out to other people. Yeah, it's, it's not hard, is it? Hope not. Okay. So um, there's the, uh, the seven churches uh, talk. Um, and so um, just moving on. All right. I want to talk about uh, a bit of BBC business. Um, last week we held the BBC business meeting. And uh, it's the, as we've, we, we, with uh, uh, tongue in cheek, we talk about it being the highlight of the year. Um, and it, it is really because it captures many, in many respects, what it is that we're about and who we are. Okay, we, we, for a moment in time, we stop and we look and we go, hey, um, this is where we're at. These are, the, these are all the stats. This is where we're going. 
and uh, it's, it's a good time. Um, so one of the things that we did last year in December at the business meeting is that we said we'd like to put the budget up significantly because we needed to invest in some staff that allowed us to ensure this place runs, runs really well. And so we put the, the budget up 17%, which is a lot in one leap. Any of you people in business know 17% of anything's a lot. And so we're really grateful to say that um, we've hit 15% on that increase. And so we just got 2% to go. So we've got a really, really happy, uh, happy treasurer, Bernice. She's got a smile on her face and, and all that. But uh, what we do also know is that based upon our figures from the last few years, we've had this phenomenon that after the end of the financial year, our giving goes like this, it falls off a cliff. So um, this, is where we, this is why we set up the counselling centre, so that Bernice had somewhere to go. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I'll be in the other room talking about uh, dinner for eight. That's why we've got two cabins. <laughs> and um, so I, I just need to put it out there and say, look, uh, I, I know a lot of people wash up their finances at the end of the financial year, etc. Uh, but just to say, let's keep the momentum going. Okay, it's really important. So I just needed to let you know that. Um, to be literal about this, to be quite literal, um, we're 2% off our targets um, as of end of May, uh, sorry, end of April, uh, but the giving dropped 11% in May. It's just the way that happens. So just need to, you know, I need to get a second job. Um, so moving on from here, we're gonna talk about the, the big thrust of what happened at our, our building sorry, at our business meeting, which was about our buildings. Uh, we put these building projects on hold a couple of years ago uh, because we got offered a piece of land on State Highway 2, which was way too amazing to not stop, pause, and check it out and see what was, was happening with that land. But we decided that uh, there were other purposes for the land and the folks who offered us the opportunity to purchase it, uh, we're working with them to ensure that uh, God gets the greatest value out of that. So what I want to do this morning is just pick up where we left off and say that um, um, this, this building here is, these different colours, I should say, are about the different projects that we're wanting to embark upon. Um, this area here um, is the new administration and cafe area. So what we'll be doing is extending, there's the footpath there, extending the, the uh, administration area out here to give our staff um, some extra space, which is well needed. Uh, as you can see, there's a whole deck and courtyard area out here beside the main entranceway, uh, with the kauri tree right in the middle there, that'll be nice. Uh, but this space through here is going to be used by the staff during the week, and then um, these doors will slide away for the weekend, and we get to have all of this space here for our cafe and the like um, after the services on Sunday. So effectively doubling the area that we have for cafe. Okay, so it's exciting, eh? You like that? So we're going for that. And, um, and then the second stage of this is we're wanting to increase the, the area and the, uh, the flexibility and the ability of our children's ministry to uh, do things well. We want to be able to put in here a whole new um, welcoming area so that we can check the kids in and ensure that they're safe. Uh, this, this area here is the, the, uncovered court, the covered courtyard as we know it now, but that'll be covered in completely. And, um, and a new mum's room, which we'll be able to, we'll be able to see the people through the wall, they'll be able to wave at us there. Uh, and so the kitchen... Um, a new toilet block, etc. And then um, using the current portico as a framework, um, the next stage, third stage, would be to build a, uh, a chapel out in that front area there, uh, which we think hold 100, 120, maybe 140 people, depending on where we end up. But a, a really good sacred space that we can use for, for prayer or for smaller events, for example, funerals or weddings, if that was appropriate. But, um, and then the fourth, if we need to, we'll be 
looking at extending the auditorium, but that's a, a wait and see thing. We've got permission from the council to do that. Uh, when we got the resource consent done, we were allowed to push this back another nine metres, I think it is, and that will give us a, a whole lot more, more space. So for us as a, as, a, um, as a community, we're wanting to be able to embrace what it is that God has for us in the future. And what I mentioned before about this being an engine room is really the truth. The, the building is an engine. The building is a tool. We are the church. We are the church. But we're wanting to invest in this future. And so therefore, you get some pictures there. Um, we've got some booklets that are going to be available next week. And um, you'll be able to pick those up next week and see all this in finer detail for yourselves. Uh, but let me just take you through this. Um, there's some idea of what that office space would look like. These are just ideas. They're not set in concrete, but this is the sort of stuff we're aiming at. Um, the children's space, you can see also that, that atrium area there covered in. Um, has, has some real potential for some wonderful creativity. Um, and then a chapel, um, as you could envision that, coming straight out from that portico area there and then flowing back straight into the cafe. I think it's going to be a fantastic space. And um, the auditorium, uh, there's somebody's church. I don't know whose it is, but it looks flash. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll be able to take opportunity to, to do that. So big goals, eh? Big lofty goals. But God's a big God. And as a church... I believe the, the, big, the big thing we're moving into right now is that we're blessed to be a blessing. That's the critical thing. You know, the maturing of faith uh, brings us to a point where we are able to give more than take. And that, to me, is a vital part of any church's mission. We measure ourselves by what we can give away, what we can do, how we can help others, how we can build community. You know, the church, this church is, is uh, very involved in the, helping the helping other churches around this district and increasingly around the nation. So even the, some of the things that we are doing internally here with our staff are, are meeting with other church teams, meeting with other pastors. Uh, we're wanting to be able to continue to position ourselves, not only to meet the demands of the local mission that God has for us here and overseas, but we want to be able to bless other churches around. You know, we just tell folks who ring us, say, can we come and spend some time with you? We'd love to have you come. And so we, we host them in our homes, uh, we, we give them meals, and we show them around the place, we sit them down with our staff, and then we say, anything you like that has got the potential to have your name on it, take it. So, you know, take all our administration forms, just put your name on the top of them. You know, any ideas that you can take from us, take them. Anything that we can get from you, we'll take that too, because it's always a two-way street or any communication with God's people. But all of us are just wanting to invest in others. It was great to hear from Colin Grootsmarker at the business meeting last week. Colin is uh, leading our church plant out at Golden Sands at Papamore. Uh, they are in, in about three or four weeks moving into a new premises because they've outgrown the first one. Okay, it's a great problem, isn't it? But they're averaging over 100 people in this little wee um, building, uh, sorry, little wee um, commercial building unit uh, they call it the concrete cathedral because it's just all concrete slabs. Apparently the music is amazing because you sing once, you hear yourself four times. Um, and, uh, but they're, they're moving into what was the uh, Habitat for Humanity um, storage and office facility. So it's going to treble their space, give them a whole lot of new area of contact with the community. So again, we're wanting to see this sort of thing happen and we're wanting to be able to do more of it. Does it make sense? So all this costs money, of course, and um, and we've got um, we've got five hundred thousand in the bank already, and so we're going. We're wanting to stage this. We want to keep this really simple. We're only going to build what we can pay for. Okay. So um, stage one will cost one point two, and then it goes up another nine hundred for the kitchen and kids chapel, just under four hundred auditorium. And uh, the total is 3.3 .3 million, if you say it real quick. That's good. <laughs> okay. 
But just tie that back to uh, the relative price of uh, a home in the area, and all of a sudden you've got a perspective on it. Um, I remember when we came into this building, when we first built here, um, we had a mortgage of over $800,000, and that was equivalent to three and a half homes in Bethlehem. Okay, now, you, now you'd be lucky if you could, well, you barely could buy one home for that, could you? Um, so you need to put this in perspective, okay? Sad reality is that your house earns more money than you do in most cases, all right? So, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to, over the next few weeks, we're going to be putting out uh, pledge cards. And um, it's an opportunity for you as a family, as an individual to go away and just seek the Lord about what it is that you can, you can do to help make this happen. And for some of you, God's going to put a big ask upon you. He's going to ask you to sacrifice a lot. Uh, for those who are just saying, look, I'm not on that stage and I want to contribute, uh, Kyle, our, um, our, our exec pastor last week at the um, business meeting, rightly reminded us that um, sacrificing a cup of coffee a couple of times a week would make all the difference and we all get a chance to buy in. So we're wanting to keep those in front of you. But the goal being, and this is a real simple thing to understand here, is that uh, when the pledges come in and we get to a certain point and we can say, Okay, there are enough pledges over, say, two or three year commitment of people who are saying, I'll give X amount over two or three years. If we see at that point that that exceeds any of these targets here, we'll go to Christian Savings, formerly known as Baptist Savings, and we'll say, look, we'll build this now on the promise that this funding will come in over the next couple of years, so we'll just get a bridging loan. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, you've probably done this sort of thing in your own home at certain times. Um, and so we want to build this in keeping with what it is that we have come in. And um, I think it's a really important thing because it gives us the ability to keep momentum going at the operations end of our church. We want to be able to keep mission front and centre. Um, we, we want you to be able to take this as a challenge to, to be able to give the extra. Okay, This isn't saying, OK, well, we won't give to operations and we'll give to building. That's not going to help at all. Um, but we're just really wanting folks to, to get involved. Now, church building projects are, are challenging for everybody um, because they're actually asking us to trust God and trust each other that we aren't going to be the sole contributor to this mission of building. What we've seen over the years, though, is as we've trusted God for this, um, there has been um, an amazing outpouring of God's generosity amongst us. And, I, and I'm just so humbled by that. Uh, there's also, um, I've probably had lots of conversations with different people about how it is that they give and why they would give and, you know, and some people disappear when there's these sorts of things, you know. I've had scenarios where, um, you know, people um, sort of wander off and say, oh, I'm, I'm into missions, I'm not into buildings. So where are you going? Oh, I'm going to go to a church in town. Oh, okay. Is it the one that was paid for by a previous generation? Yeah, that's the one. So I'll stay there until, um, until you're done. Then I might come back and have a look and see what it looks like. So um, I only say that, use that illustration because it's true. <laughs> because it's true. Um, and, you know, I've heard all the theology about, you know, God doesn't like buildings. Well, he does. He actually does, because they're a place of identity. Okay, they're a place of identity. Um, so, for a lot of us, um, you've been on this road for a long time, and uh, this isn't the first time you've heard an appeal like this. Um, all I can really do is say, see the evidence. God's used your money to build the kingdom. And... Um, and I suppose at one level, I want to probably just speak out to a generation similar in age to me. Um, I, I have this, have this sense, and it's not, not a, necessarily a prophetic sense. It's more just a looking at the economic realities of our world today. Um, the generation coming in behind us, my kids' age, is, are going to really struggle to accumulate the asset base that we've been able to do. And this is one of those reasons why I feel we need to do this with cash. I don't want to encumber another generation with a debt that we could pay for. Um, my, my daughter and son-in-law are trying to buy their first house in Auckland. 
And um, um, they looked at a house the other day in Mangari, 850,000. It was um, 80 square metres. Hadn't been touched since 1953. So you can imagine what that was like. And, um, and they, they couldn't, couldn't buy it for that. You know? And you go, wow. And this is on top of you know, student loans. Um, and so you've got this generation of young people who are growing through this. And uh, by accident, by owning homes, if we've been privileged enough to do that, um, we become some of the wealthiest people in the world. Yeah. It's great, eh? If we sold our houses and moved to Malawi, we'd be amazingly wealthy. Okay. So, we're going to have some pledge cards made available in the next week or two. Okay. Uh, and just to remind you that we're not all about money. And those of you who have turned up today for the first time, sorry. Um, Apologise for that. I've probably fulfilled every, of your, every one of your worst expectations about church and how we uh, just get told off and talk about money. Well, um, we've got a series coming up for everybody uh, starting in about four weeks' time. Uh, it's about the life of Peter. So we're going to be looking at it in two parts. We're going to be looking at it as Peter the disciple, the Peter that we find in the book, books of the Gospels. And that guy is very much like all of us, I think. Uh, enthusiastic. But always in trouble. <laughs> uh, with all of his energy, he was doing dumb stuff all the time. You know, and making bad mistakes, saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing. Uh, he was full of zeal for God, and then his heart would just give way, and he'd run. And then you move into uh, Peter the Apostle, which is the second part of this series, and we see this transformation that happens when this guy actually meets God, and he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it's like, can two people be so different but still be one person. And so I'm really excited about this. I'm looking forward to uh, going through Peter's life with you because I think for, for a lot of us, it's just going to be like holding up a mirror and saying, can you see yourself here? Okay? Have you ever made mistakes like this? Have you ever made bold steps of faith like this? And we're going to find ourselves represented here. And it's going to be very much our story as, we follow Christ, as he follows Christ, so do we. Does that sound good? I'm looking forward to it. So we're going to finish here, and um, because I've rabbited it on, um, I'm going to ask the, the band to uh, take a break and not come out. <laughs> That's the most enthusiastic response I've heard from you, Darren, for a long time. Okay, um, also, just, I'm just going to keep on harping on about this in the, in the few months ahead, but let's work really hard at just getting ourselves connected with some people we might not have known before, okay? Um, that's just so vital. It's simple, very much human stuff, but if we all take responsibility for that, um, it's transformational for our community. Let's stand and I'll pray for us. Yeah, Monica's just shouted out here um, if you want to know more about Jesus' hospitality, come to the evening service, and uh, they're doing a series called The Table. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, uh, for your story that is built within us in our church. And in this time today of, uh, of, uh, of reflection, a time of anticipation, a time of sobriety when we have to look at um, some hard, cold facts about, our, our, about money and about buildings and about what we could do better. Um, Lord, we pray that you take all of these things and you, you plant these seeds deep within our heart for us to be able to own them collectively so that um, we are a community because of our commune, our commune together, our desire together to, to serve you and to be, be able to do things bigger than ourselves because you're present and your vision is in the midst of us. God, we, we want to pray that you give wisdom to people who are in charge of um, pushing the go button on things like money and buildings and consents and, and all of those really, really important things that have to be done well. Uh, we, we just thank you, Lord, for mission. 
that is so vital. It's the blood of our church, and it gives us a purpose beyond ourselves. Lord, so many things that we do, so many things I couldn't even begin to mention today. But Lord, we are just so grateful that you've trusted us over 30 years with a legacy that is already in a place where we can help and bless others. Lord, we're blessed to be a blessing, just like Abraham was. And we just want to fulfill that mission, fulfill that purpose, and to be able to be ensuring that we're in that right place to be able to do that. So I ask your blessing upon us. May we just know that apostolic calling into the future that you put upon our church. And may we understand the leading of your spirit for us personally and collectively in this day. So we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.